Saddam Hussein served as the formal president of Iraq from 1979 to the year 2003. He was an evil man who didn't care at all for human life. It is conservatively estimated that over 250,000 of his countrymen were killed during um, Hussein's presidency. When Iraq invaded and controlled Kuwait in the year 1990, Saudi Arabia appealed to the United States for help because Saudi Arabia realized they would probably be the next nation that Hussein would invade. So President George Herbert Bush got on the telephone. He called leaders in Canada and Spain and France and Italy and England and Turkey and other nations to form a coalition against Hussein. Not only was Hussein threatened should he choose to invade other countries, but he was ordered to withdraw from Kuwait as well. A coalition army composed of soldiers from all around the world who came from different cultures and different classes, from different races and different religions, rallied together in the Middle East for one purpose, to draw a line in the sand. This ethnically diverse army defeated Saddam Hussein in a matter of a few days because they fought together against a common enemy. The evil personality from whom Hussein received his orders has also invaded territory he did not create and he does not own. The devil has brought death, disease, destruction into many lives and many families he has assaulted. And in response, God has called together his own coalition comprised of people with varying colors of skin, Hispanic people and Arab people, people from different cultures and classes, people from different races and riches, people with different languages and traditions. And God has called this coalition that He has formed His church with orders to draw a line in the sand. This ethnically diverse spiritual army must fight their common enemy together, not only to prevent Satan from taking further territory that does not belong to him, but to also take back territory that he has already claimed. A major problem stifling the effectiveness of Christ's church in America is that even though his church is composed of Many people from different races and nationalities, people from varying walks of life and varying degrees of wealth, Christ's church in America is still undeniably segregated. White Christians worship together. Black Christians worship together. Hispanic Christians worship together. In the larger cities, you can find Vietnamese Christians worshiping together and Korean Christians worshiping together and Burmese Christians worshiping together. I grew up in a tiny town of 5,500 people, and yet there were two Lutheran congregations from the same Lutheran synod in that same town. One congregation was established in 1881 as an English-speaking congregation, Lutheran Church, and the other was established eight years later in 1889 as a German-speaking Lutheran Church, only one block away. And yet there seems to be very little coalition building amongst all these Christian ethnicities in America, according to Dr. Michael Emerson from Rice University, 85% of the over 300,000 churches in America, 85% of them are composed of uh, one, 90% or more of one ethnic group of people. According to the 2010 census, Marshalltown is made up of approximately 24% Hispanic or Latino, 2% African American, 2% Asian, 
13% from all other cultures, including Burmese, Sudanese, Chin, and others, and 61% white. If you look around this morning, you see we're about 90 to 95% white. And I suspect the same is true for every congregation in, in Marshalltown, except the Hispanic congregation and the Burmese congregation, which are overwhelmingly comprised of their own ethnicity. Should that concern us? Does it matter? I think it does. And as we continue in our sermon series entitled This, which is the gospel, this is for everyone, we learn that the gospel is for all ethnicities around the whole world. And the wonder is, many of these ethnicities, many of these nations of people are living right here among us. And they present us with a golden opportunity to reach them without ever going on a mission trip. So we have three scriptures we're going to look at this morning. <clears throat> the first is in Galatians chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, turn with me, and I'm going to read beginning with verse 26. The Apostle Paul writes these words, You are all children of God through your faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. So if you have your outlines there, we see first of all in this passage of Scripture God's intention for his church. In the Jewish mind of the first century, there were Jews and there was everyone else. You were either Jew or you were Gentile. If you were not a Jew, you were a Gentile. It didn't matter what the color of your skin was. It didn't matter how rich or poor you were. It didn't matter whether you live, where you lived. It didn't matter whether you were male or female. It didn't matter whether you were slave or free, whether you were living in Asia or Europe or Africa. In the Jewish mind, there was us and there was them. And the Jews hated them, the Gentiles, with a passion. The Jews saw themselves as the privileged of God, and the rest of the world was headed for hell. That's how it was. And then Jesus comes on the scene, and Jesus travels through Gentile territory on his missionary journeys. Jesus ministers in Gentile cities. Jesus heals Gentile people. And in a clear reference to Gentiles, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there will be one flock. There will be one shepherd. Jesus' love for all people of all nations was very evident in His last instructions to His disciples. Go and make disciples where? Of all nations. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be My witnesses beginning here in Jerusalem. Ultimately, Judea and Samaria, and eventually you will be my witnesses to the utter ends of the earth. God's intention for His church was that His church include all people, including the Gentiles. And so, over the centuries, Jewish people had fanned out over various parts of the world due to persecution, a famine, a sometimes forced deportation. And in those regions of the world where they settled, they would take on, they would learn the customs and, and the language and the culture of the lands they lived in. 
And so as we get to Acts chapter 2, we see in verse 5 of Acts 2 that many of these God-fearing Jews who had scattered to various parts of the world had gathered in Jerusalem in Acts 2 for the Jewish feast known as Pentecost. And while they're there, somehow, without any previous knowledge of these languages, Jesus' disciples break out and begin talking in the languages and in the dialects from which the lands from which these people had come. Now a little bit later, Peter addresses the whole group, the thousands who were assembled, and he probably spoke to them in Greek, which was a universal language that could be understood by most at the time in the first century. But from the beginning, God acknowledged people's linguistic differences. God showed a respect for their diversity. In other words, diversity was a part of the church's DNA from its very birth. So in Galatians chapter 3, Paul is not suggesting that people who, some, or people who become Christians are now Somehow they're not Jews, and somehow they're not Gentiles. As a matter of fact, Paul called himself on more than one occasion a Hebrew, and an Israelite, a son of Abraham. He recognized that. And Paul wasn't implying here that when we come up out of the baptistry, somehow we're not a male or a female anymore. That's not what he's saying. Paul is simply telling us in Galatians chapter 3 that when we commit our lives to Jesus Christ, we become brothers and and sisters who no longer separate ourselves from one another because of our cultural differences or our linguistic differences or our material differences. Paul says in three, uh, Galatians 3, verse 28, we are one. Wherever we live, whoever we are, in Christ, we are one. We are all true children of Abraham. We are all heirs to the same promise that God gave to Abraham. And what was that promise? God promised Abraham, I will bless you, Abraham, so you can be a blessing to others. And so in Christ, as heirs of Abraham's promise, regardless of who you are, regardless of what you've done in the past, regardless of where you've been, God says, listen, I am going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to others. And Paul would also write to the Ephesian Christians, Christ himself has brought peace to us. Christ united Jews and Gentiles. And let me add to that if I can. Christ united Jews and Gentiles. Christ has united whites and blacks, and Arabs, and Israelis, and men, and women, rich and poor, white collar, blue collar, young people, old people, management, union. Christ has united all of us into one people. When in his own body on the cross, Jesus broke down the wall of hostility that separated us, Christ reconciled both groups all groups to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility toward one another was put to death. It's gone. People who couldn't get along together before now can because of what Christ has done for us. In order to grow, lobsters have to rid themselves of their old hard protective shell and they have to grow a new one, a larger one. And they'll do this approximately 25 times before they are five years of age. And then when they get to be an adult lobster, they, they go through this process, which is a messy process. Uh, it's an ugly process. And they do this about once a year after that. This, this old, hard shell, first it cracks. The lobster kind of lays on its side, flexes its muscles, and rids itself of that old crack. Shell. Now, there's a period of time where it has to form a, a new shell, a bigger shell, an older shell, when it's, it's vulnerable. 
to the elements around it. In the same way, it's much more comfortable worshiping and fellowshipping and and growing spiritually with those who look like us. With those who think like us. With those who live in our same neighborhood, etc. It's uncomfortable when we break away from our old habits. It's uncomfortable reaching out to people that we haven't yet met. It's uncomfortable forming relationships with people who are different from ourselves. But when the church emerges from its shell and embraces its multicultural heritage, it becomes larger and bigger and more fruitful for God's kingdom. You see, a careful study of the New Testament reveals that God was multicultural before anyone else ever knew the definition of the term. And because God loves all people, heaven is multicultural. And because heaven is multicultural, God intends for His church to be multicultural. And if that is God's intention for His church, don't you think it should be our intention for His church as well? Uh, Now if you'll turn with me to chapter 2 of Galatians. I want to look at the subtle sin of prejudice. Galatians 2, beginning with verse 11. Paul writes, But when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face, for what he did was very wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile Christians who were not circumcised, But afterwards, when some friends of James came from Jerusalem, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He he was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. And as a result, other Jewish Christians followed Peter's hypocrisy and even Barnabas. A rock was led astray by their hypocrisy. The subtle sin of prejudice. I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago that the Apostle Peter preached the very first gospel sermon on the day of Pentecost, and that is found for us in Acts chapter 2. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, Peter repeated a prophecy from Joel, an 800-year-old prophecy that said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. But Peter, even though he used that in his first gospel sermon, I don't think Peter fully understood that truth until Acts chapter 10. It was in Acts chapter 10, Peter learned that God's family is big enough to include both Jew and Gentiles. But, like so many of us, Peter was still subject to the Winds of public opinion, at least in some areas. I think sometimes we're kind of like that. Some areas of our Christian walk, man, we're rock solid and nobody's going to move us when it comes to a belief in a certain thing. And then there are other areas where sometimes we're still kind of wavering there, listening to what others are telling us, influenced by what others think. So in Galatians chapter 2, Peter is enjoying a potluck meal with his newfound Gentile Christian friends. I mean, he's having a blast. He's getting to know these people. You know, his, his Jewish heritage had prevented him from really getting to know these people until now. And now that Christ has broken down these barriers and God has opened up his family to all, Peter's having a good time getting to know these individuals instead of just stereotyping them. But when some of his homies from Jerusalem show up there at Antioch, Peter was afraid of what they might say when they saw him eating and fellowshipping with these Gentile Christians. So Peter backs away from these Gentile Christians because Peter was more concerned about what others would think of him than he was with what God would think of him. 
And Paul tells us, unfortunately, some of Peter's friends took their cue from him. They backed away from these Gentile Christians as well. And even Barnabas was a rock. Even Barnabas was influenced by Peter. So, Paul says, man, he confronted Peter with the truth. Paul didn't coddle Peter. He didn't say, hey, Peter, come on, let's cut these people a little slack here. You you don't realize the conditions they've been under. Paul didn't say to Peter, hey, Peter, I think it'd be a good idea for you to attend a race relations class. Paul says, I got right in Peter's face. And I told him to his face, his actions were sin. To relate to a brother or a sister in Christ primarily upon whether we have the same skin color or we live in the same neighborhood or we speak the same language or we have approximately the same income, that is sin. It doesn't matter how long we've been a Christian, it doesn't matter what, what role we may have in the church, why Peter shows us even apostles can be prone to the sin of prejudice. It's such a subtle sin. I mean, we may not even see it in ourselves. We may avoid talking to people of a different colored skin or different ethnicity because we don't know what to say. So we just avoid them. Or or we stereotype everybody of a certain ethnicity because because one person of that ethnicity hurt us many years ago and, and now we assume everybody else is like that as well. I was visiting with a member last weekend. who said that she and her husband had been prejudiced toward Hispanics. But in the last few weeks, two different crews had come to their house, their place. And she said they were so friendly. They were so nice. They were so hardworking. They were thoughtful. And she said, my mind has changed. It's amazing how much our character can grow, how much we can grow spiritually when we take the time to really get to know people instead of just pigeonholing them in our preconceived boxes. That's what God calls us to do. We're not supposed to be like the rest of the world. Gary Alt is one of the nation's most respected wildlife experts. He's employed by the Pennsylvania Game Commission. Alt would oftentimes find lost or orphaned bear cubs, and no matter how hard you know, he'd try and pawn off that bear cub on, a, on another um, mother bear, they just wouldn't accept him. He says, and I'm quoting here, he says, A mother bear labels cubs as her own by licking them. Good thing humans don't do that, isn't it? And she uses the smell of her saliva to identify them. So if a female bear smells a cub that isn't hers, she may do more than ignore it. She may even kill it. Apparently female bears aren't rational creatures. You can't just walk up to a female bear and say, hey, we got a special circumstance here. This, this uh, cub was found lost, don't know where its mother uh, has gone. Could you adopt it? They, they don't respond to that. So Gary Alt decided to try something. He sedated a mother bear, smeared Vicks VapoRub on her nose, and placed a bear cub, an orphan bear cub, in her den. And so when the mother bear woke up, she couldn't smell the difference between her bear cub and an orphan cub. And by the time the Vicks wore off, she had already licked 
the new cub and treated the orphan cub as her own. Ingenious. We all have some prejudices, some biases, instances when we haven't shown unconditional love like we should have. Unfortunately, rubbing Vicks VapoRub under our nose doesn't work in helping us overcome our prejudices and our biases like it does a mother bear. But the good news is there's one who has promised to give us a new heart. And I need look no further than my own life how amazing it is that with a new heart and the power of the Holy Spirit, how we can change our ideas and change our opinions and change our biases and change our prejudices toward people because of what God is doing in us and through us. When you read the New Testament, one characteristic of Christ's church that stands out is its diversity. Beginning with Pentecost, the church of Jesus Christ smashed the gender barriers and the racial barriers and the class barriers that had characterized Jewish congregations up to that point. My desire has long been that New Hope look as diverse as heaven looks. That we be a reflection of what heaven already is. So how do we do that? Turn with me to Romans chapter 15. Paul writes these words to the Christians living in Rome that are just as applicable to us today. Beginning with verse 7, Paul writes, Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you, so that God will be given glory. Remember that Christ came as a servant to the Jews to show that God is true to the promises he made to their ancestors. Christ also came so that the Gentiles might give glory to God for his mercies to them. And that is what the psalmist meant when he wrote, For this I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing praises to your name. And in another place it is written, Rejoice with his people, you Gentiles. And yet again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Praise him, all you people of the earth. And in another place Isaiah said, The heir to David's throne will come, and he will rule over the Gentiles, and they will place their hope on him. Paul says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. We see in this passage that a a truly multicultural church is, is, first of all, an accepting, welcoming church. You see there in verse 7? Because Jesus Christ has accepted us and welcomed us into His family. We also need to accept and welcome all people into God's family. And Paul says, doing so honors God. When God sees all of us welcoming and accepting, it honors Him. Second of all, in verses 8 and 9, we see that God desires an inclusive church. God never intended His promises to be limited just to the Jews. A careful read through the Old Testament, and Paul cites several examples here for us in these few verses, shows that it's always been God's plan to include the nations. Always. And because that's the case, then we need to be inclusive of all people, regardless of their nationality, regardless of their sexual orientation, regardless of their political views, regardless of how much money they do or don't make. That doesn't mean we have to compromise our beliefs that are based on the solid foundation of God's Word. It just means we have to be willing to open our hearts to those different from ourselves, those still needing what we have found in Jesus Christ. In verses 9-11, through we see that God wants a worshiping church. Three times in these three verses, God calls Gentiles and Jews to worship together. Praise is a universal language that brings 
people together. I, I remember when our group was in the Holy Land last year, and we were in uh, the church there in, in Bethlehem. And there's all kinds of people groups from various parts of the world. You could, you could tell. And our little group began singing, um, I think it was Angels We Have Heard on High. And we're singing that in English. And after a few verses, another group starts singing in, in their language. And I don't know what language it was. It was just cool that we all understood we were praising the Lord together in our various languages, part of the same body, even though we had differences. Do you know the word hallelujah means the same thing? In every, not means, it's, it's the same word in every language. So no matter where you are on planet earth, you hear the word hallelujah, you know it means praise the Lord. God is honored when His people join together in any language to worship and praise Him. We see in verse 12 that God wants an evangelistic church. This hope is for every Gentile as surely as it was for Jews. Jesus Christ. And that's why Christians for 2,000 years have sent missionaries to other parts of the world to share the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We have a missions team in Taiwan right now. Three weeks they will be there holding sports camps. And while they're holding sports camps for those young Taiwanese children, they'll be sharing with them the love of Jesus Christ, the wonderful truth that, that God loves them. But here's a neat thing that I shared with you earlier. The nations are coming to us. They're right here. They're living among us. They're working among us. They're, they're studying among us. And the question we've got to ask ourselves, how intentional are we at reaching them? Are we intentional? Did you know there's a group of Hispanics that use our building on Tuesday night to study the Word of God? Many of them will be at our picnic next Sunday. And I would highly encourage you to get out of our comfort zone, to say hi, to engage in a conversation. Not just with them, but with anybody who looks like they're lost and alone. How many times do we go to a picnic and see people sitting by themselves. If they're lonely, they need somebody to engage in a conversation with them. And then we see in verse 13 that God wants an overflowing church. God wants His church to overflow with hope. My goodness, we ought to be the happiest, most optimistic, most encouraging, most forward-looking, most creative most dynamic, most hope-filled people on planet Earth. Because we are, we got something to share. So we need to do it. When I was growing up, I loved action heroes. My, one of my favorites was Superman. Anybody else like Superman? All right, there's three of us. We'll form a little support group, I guess. Criminals of um, Metropolis would come out and wreak havoc there on the city, and somebody at the Daily Planet would get the story, and somebody would say, where's Superman? And eventually Clark Kent would hear about the troubles that are going on, and he'd take off his glasses and He'd loosen his tie and he'd find a closet someplace or a phone booth someplace and he'd get into this spandex type blue and red jumpsuit with a great big S on it. And in that moment you knew he wasn't Clark Kent anymore, was he? In that moment you knew he was different. You knew he was faster than a speeding bullet. Why, he was more powerful than a locomotive. This guy could leap onto a, a skyscraper with one single bound. And as he's streaking through the air, some people would say, look, it's a bird. And others would say, no, nah, it's a plane. And others would say, no, nah, it's Superman. And when Superman appeared on the scene, everything changed, didn't it? Why? 
Superman could catch bullets with his bare hands. He could bend a gun. He could, he could bend a, a knife with his bare hands. How did he do that? Well, he wasn't from here, was he? He was from a faraway planet called Krypton. And when he brought the power of that sphere and made it work here in this sphere, he was able to transform this sphere to look like that sphere because the power of Krypton came to earth. Seems to me we all need to be taking a trip into God's telephone booth Word, we all need to be getting into the Word because it's there that it transformed the way we've thought about people in the past. We need to change the way we've talked about people and related to people. Why? Because we've got this big S on our chest and it says saved. Saint. And with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can bring heavenly power down to earth and transform this world we live in. Why? Because we think differently and we live differently and people can see that. We can show them by the way that we relate to others we don't belong to this world. Because when it's all said and done, we don't. 